got my watercolor glove all freshly washed up and I'm going to be putting it on. Last week we did this brush crystal colors demo for a tenual rabbit study. I did a video on YouTube recently and thank you Ava for reminding me but this stuff does flake off even after it's dry so when I went to go do the abstract effects cards the little powdery things were just falling off the paper and I was putting the cards away so if you're gonna send this to somebody in the mail you're gonna have to do some kind of a fixative or a dry fixative wax or something. That's just another reason for me not to like the brushes. Arthur Rackham study this week and I was gonna make the effects bleed because last week I talked all about how it was really irritating that the effects were bleeding. This time I'm actually gonna make it so that we can understand that effects can bleed and it'll be great. So I'll use one pen that is waterproof so it doesn't bleed and that, this is the Zig Rider and the other two pens that I'll be using that do bleed are the Elegant Rider and just this Papermate Flare and if the tips aren't the, on these are not fine enough you should have a 20 over 0 spotter with you so that you can go ahead and ink the finer areas with it. That's what I did for the face and the hands. I also have a white gel pen because it'll help me correct anything. If So I did this, these illustrations for a published book commission two years ago or so whenever I did this project and the publisher wanted ink illustrations. So I used the Elegant Writer pen because I thought that when you put water on it, it gives these really cool bleeds. Now, the, the important thing is, is that just like with the Rackham study that we're going to do today, that we don't want it to bleed everywhere because if you go ahead and wet everything, you'll just get a big fat mess. So you have to have selective bleeding, try to judge your values, the weight and balance of it. I used the Elegant Writer for the whole thing and then some parts of it I made it bleed and it gives you these great values and shadows and all these areas. You can actually pick up the ink from certain areas and use it to shade parts of the face just like you would with the watercolor off of a palette and that's a smart thing to do if you don't want to get everything too inky and one of the reasons that her face and her features haven't bled is again I did the face with permanent marker just like I did for this study I did the face and the hands with the zig and we're going to do the rest of it with the elegant writer here's another good example where they find the check that they thought the kids stole in the Monopoly game money. Notice how I made the value of all of the Monopoly money and the piece is much darker than the check. Now the check is white so that's easy to do but I would have done that anyway because I wanted to make sure that when the mom finds it that when she's pulling it out that it stands out in comparison to the rest of the money. And I did the same thing for her hands that I was talking about earlier, which is I tried to use a selective amount of dabbing for creating the values. It's really a sort of hit or miss type of thing. Let's just do a, a little bit of a swirly dwirl up here in the paper mate and do one with the elegant writer as well. Okay, so I'll label them. This is the elegant writer, paper mate. And I'll also do a line in the zig so that you can see that the zig does not bleed. And I will also do a thicker line. The zig is dual tip, so it has two sides. So now if I come back with a brush, just with water, no ink on it, no paint on it, the paper mate should bleed, and it does. If you're using a marker for inking and you don't want it to bleed and it happens to be a water soluble marker, do your inking last. Do your watercolor or any other layers first because you don't want it to bleed. Do you see the delicious sort of color that comes out of the Elegant Rider? It's like green and purple and red and everything and there's different separations of the dye. So it's a lot prettier than the Paper Mate, which is why I think Carlin Holman chose the Elegant Rider because there are other water soluble markers. It's because this gives really nice separation of color. In fact, I was kind of sad for those Lenny commission pieces because the publisher only published those pieces in black and white and they sort of lost all these really cool pinky purple tints that come out because, you know, they were asking for black and white um, ink illustrations for that book. So I was kind of sad. Now here's the Zig. Let me make sure I get the last of my ink out of this and you see it doesn't bleed. Waterproof ink piece and I come back with watercolor, see how that's just not budging? That's the kind of ink you want to use. If you want to play with those nice effects, you want to use the Elegant Writer. But it is way more lack of control and blooms and separations of color, so you have to sort of be okay with it if things don't go well. This black is actually made from a red and a green, so when you wet it out, actually that red and that green separates out and that's what you end up seeing when you see the red, the pink, the purple, and the green there. But this is one of the reasons why I'm not going to use the paper mate too much because I don't want this to be the bleed quality on this illustration. I want it to be prettier. So I'm just going to put the paper mate away. Now to talk about Arthur Rackham. He worked during the late 1800s and the turn of the century. Keep her dress a lighter value and maybe even add some pale colors. But I'm going to let that become a very dark value behind her. Same thing for the chairs. A great example of somebody to check out for the Elegant Writer pen use is an excellent artist named Carlin Holman 
And she's actually the first person I saw using the Elegant Rider some years ago, and I didn't really know anything about making pieces bleed or semi-bleed, and she actually does more sort of loose pieces. The publisher was asking for pen and ink, and I wanted to do something a little bit more exciting than what I typically do, so I just thought that was a great idea to end up doing some of the piece bleeding and everything and the rest of it not. And the Elegant Rider is acid-free. It is not archival. This Elegant Rider is probably one of the few non-light fast materials that I have. Rackham, as I was saying, worked over the turn of the century. He was born in 1867. He died in 1939, so he died before World War II was over. Very much a man of a different time, one of the lead Golden Age illustrators working during that period, and the golden age of illustration was that turn of the century, along with people like Edmund Dulac and Maxfield Parrish. And he did a lot of pen and ink fantasy pieces, which is why we're doing a study of his today, because he is an excellent person for inking. I, I said that to you guys last week as I was doing the Tenniel study. Is that another great illustrator to look to for ink apart from Tenniel is Arthur Rackham. I think I could always draw or paint better if I wasn't talking, so I just do it because I am on the live stream. Arthur Rackham, like Duloc, he did like this inky style that was a stylized realism. Obviously this is not hyper-realism, not even close. The garment folds were never real. They always sort of made them up. So they had like these weird garment folds that look very cool and sort of Nouveau-ish, you know, but they don't actually look realistic. So one of the reasons this is not such a hard piece to ink is because it doesn't really matter if these effects on the folds don't look hyper-realistic because that's not what Rackham was going for and in doing a study of his piece it's not what I'm going for either. People like Kai Nielsen or Edmund Duloc have these amazing color washes and everything. For him instead I'd like to make use of the, the ink work and the line work and sort of play around with that and we're going to take it a step further by bleeding it out which is not something he did. So I don't know if he'd be too happy with what we're doing with his study, but we are going to make it an ink dominant piece, but I'm going to try to take advantage of these bleeds. And the other thing that the Elegant Writer does, unlike the brushes that just keep re-wetting, like, you know, forever and ever and ever, after you wet this once, after you wet this marker once, it actually does not re-wet. It gets stuck into the paper after that. So if you want to come back in with color after you do the bleeds once, you can totally do that. So I think the only thing not perfect about this pen is really that it's not archival. I wish they'd make it into an archival dye that they put in there, and then it would really be a perfect pen. It is acid-free, contrary to what it might seem like when I totally bash those Brescio Crystal Colors last week, is that there are some tools that I own that are not light fast that I actually appreciate, and this is one of them. Yeah, fountain pen inks are supposed to bleed with water, and a lot of them are light fast. So if you get like Higgins ink, for example, I think it's actually light fast, water soluble light fast ink that is made for a dip nib pen or a fountain pen because they don't want those nibs to clog, so they typically make those inks water-soluble. As soon as you draw a box there, you actually understand your paper space a lot more. Than he was British, but he had a Nordic drawing style and he had myth-type characters, which is what you see here, mixed with a Japanese woodblock. This is one of the reasons why he was in the Golden Age of Illustration, which was all of these illustrators did a combination of Eastern mixed with a Western aesthetic. Yeah, so his style has this nice Japanese woodblock mixed with Western illustration, and a lot of his commissions that he did, he'd have like one color plate for a story like Sleeping Beauty or just one or two, maybe like the cover or the front piece. And the rest of them would be silhouettes of ink. It made it look like he was doing black cutouts because he did a lot of silhouette work. They let him do that. In fact, there's this really charming silhouette piece, Sleeping Beauty going up to the tower, heading towards the spindle. King and the queen are busy talking or the ministers are discussing stuff. People are making food and you can see it all in the silhouette. So it's like a really cool illustration. Carlin used too whenever she was showing her Elegant Writer pieces. She was okay with spraying the whole piece and that would make the line set a bit, but I actually don't do that because like I said her pieces were more abstract, floral abstract, and so if some of the lines blurred they just sort of melted in with the floral situation. With me it's not going to do that. It's, I'm going to come back to the zig for her hair, her headpiece, and her braids. That way again I have a little bit of control over this area. I should say that this is a letter B composition. Artists like Andrew Loomis had pointed out that there's great strength in alphabetical compositions, so if you are stuck for a strong compositional shape, just go back to your ABCs with that bar being up there, and that sort of shape like this is a lowercase b composition. 
and I drew these yesterday because it takes a long time to draw these in detail and get all the faces and hands and everything the way I want them. Moleskin journal paper, so it'll work for pen and ink and simple watercolor pieces and that's why I'm using it. I actually used a finer line in some of those places. I'll show you what I did. So I'm going to cap this side and you can go ahead and just plop some of this down. I'll wipe it up later right on my plastic. That's not on my map, that's on the plastic. And then I'm going to get my 20 over 0 in a little bit of water and swirl it around. And so you can always do some of this with the brush if your marker is not fine enough. That's basically what I'm trying to show you. So glad it's got birds on it and not rabbits. Looks like she's got a very ornate wall back there of some sort. And Rackham loved these little details. He made the background more of a character and the atmosphere more of a character than the people sometimes. You see actually very much so the entire book that he illustrated for Midsummer Night's Dream. The environment, like those trees, they're just taking over the entire landscape of the page. Got all these wild, crazy, gnarled trees with roots and the characters are just almost an afterthought. Thank God her dress is this open, simple room to breathe space because it's got a very busy chair and a very busy backdrop against her. So we need that, actually. We need that as a space to breathe. In Pan's Labyrinth, the fawn character, based off of Rackham's art and ink drawing style. So that's why it has like those swirly, whirly looking things. He drew some devils or fawns or satyrs that looked like that. That big, completely sort of getting out of control roots and twigs tree that's in Hellboy in that one scene. It's based off of Rackham's artwork too. So you can see that even though he was more than a century ago, his art style is still affecting people who are working today, not just in art, but also in film. Study of one of Rackham's pieces, but I did draw it myself for this study. When I do my original pieces, I draw my own work. I don't trace. I have been in situations where I've told myself I've earned my laurels when it comes to drawing, so I can go ahead and trace and transfer a quick sketch. And it's just never worked for me. Um, I'm a good drawer and a horrible tracer, I guess. Zig right here, because I don't want this to be wet around her face when I come back. Sort of a crookedly built chair, too, the way that he drew it in his own drawing. I actually saw this piece, the original piece, up at auction on one of these big auction websites. They're selling old illustrator's pieces. And believe it or not, the original for this, if you were to go and buy this off of that auction, is going to be about $10,000. A line is not exactly where you want it. Then just add another wood grain line and it fixes it. All right, so got my round brush. It looks like that. And I think I'll do this side first because it's a nice open area. It's going to be some of the only white space I have left. So I'm going to try to make sure that I don't overdo the bleeds here. And the more uneven that is, actually, the better it looks. And I'm going to, now that this is drying, I can bring a little bit of that down in a very light shade down to the top of her hand. So it gives me a little bit more control. I try to make sure you do directional strokes. That's important. And also try to make a patchy movement to it because you don't want it to be completely filled. Now I'm going to start to use the Elegant Writer like I would if I was shading this with watercolor. And I just really love how the Elegant Writer does these amazing pinks and greens. Because like I said, those are the two dyes that they use to make the black. So again, I'm not paying attention to the lines now. Now I'm paying attention to where I want my shadows. It's starting to look like a painted piece instead of an inked piece. And it's okay if it comes out darker because I'm okay with that area being darker underneath the chair. Just be okay with the random effects, and surprisingly enough, you'll find that random effects oftentimes turn out better than planned effects. Try to dab up as soon as you can if you want a lighter value, and also if you don't want the line to spread very much, because I don't. In this case, I want the tile to stay more or less white. Just want to give it a little bit of grout line. The hardest part was the pencil drying, doing all the, the work there, not the rest of it. The rest of it is very sort of impulsive, so ask yourself if the balance is good. White area up there, that's good. It'll help lead us as a spotlight area to her face. And I've got the chair done, and I'm glad I left that white area back there too because it's giving me a little bit of peace and quiet back there amongst all of these values. 
And this gets very dark until it gets darker underneath the chair, and again it gets light and gives me some peace and quiet just a bit underneath on the floor. But like I was telling you, it's a lowercase b composition, so this bar behind her, if it gets darker but she stays lighter in front of it, it'll make a nice sort of relief. If you spray the lines, that'll set them. I don't want to do this because this is a figural piece. Or you can touch them very lightly, and if you don't want them to spread, then just make sure you have a very thin line. After you wet them once, they won't spread before you move on to color, if you want to use color. And it's just a good idea to have the paper towel. That will really help when it comes to controlling bleeds, because that way you can get the bleed, but you can control it somewhat. And I think it really helped that, like I said, I did her face and her hands in the non-bleeding inks. It doesn't really matter that these folds aren't realistically rendered when I do the shading, because they weren't realistically rendered in the first place. So for ornamental and stylized art is it's less like showing a photograph or more like the kind of stylization you'd get if you were working with jewelry. If you wanted to shade the fabric, you could definitely do that. I just don't want to as much because I feel like there's already so much dark everywhere else that the fabric will just end up also blending into the chair. So I've got these colors in a travel tin. He had really super watery washes. All right, so I think the green checks is where it's at. It's a very muted brownish green that he has over there. I've already done a lot of runny ink. I can't make the patterns too exact, otherwise they won't really fit. So they have to also be rather random. Loose and light is what we want when it comes to these patterns. It just has the rosy pink to it, so let's start throwing that in. Looks like it's a floral design, faded, rosy pattern on the fabric. When you work with a medium, just like with color schemes, one thing has to be dominant, so the ink here is what's dominant, not the color. Choose one or the other, because if you try to make them equal, then it's probably not going to work. Work on that belt that I didn't put in, so I think I'm going to do that now. And it looks like, it almost looks like chain mail underneath it. Even with the watercolor kit that I have, it's sometimes, even though it's tiny, I feel like not taking it, so just having a notebook with the Elegant Rider and uh, a water brush is, is a great option. Okay, I think I'm trying to find the other areas where there is any more pink. It looks like there's some on her inner skirts here. And this is watercolor, so I don't have to worry about blending out the edges so quickly. I can always take a damp brush to it and it'll wet out. It's not ink. We've got such a nice safety blanket when it comes to watercolor. You can come back, lift it out, and blend it. And yet, like I said, it's water resistant after it dries, so it doesn't totally pick up. So I think it's one of the reasons why watercolor is so amazing. I know people say it's a hard medium to work with, but once you work with a lot of ink too, you realize just how in comparison watercolor is actually very forgiving. I really like the quietness of these colors. And I also am glad I did them because I think it really helps pull her out. And I think once I do the yellow in her hair and pull her out from the background, that that'll be a nice finishing touch. Okay, so I think I'm just going to go ahead and poke in the whole braid in yellow. With that yellow being as light as it is, it actually doesn't even need its edges blended out much. It sort of just does it on its own because it sort of just optically blends as you get far away. So I'm going to try to mix like a little bit of a peach there. The zig, I can use it on its side. Kind of tip that is not like the micron where it's not seated in a metal tip. So I can use it very much on its side or on its top at any angle. And it really helps with hand fatigue. With the Micron, you have to use it completely upright. And I think that's the reason why, even though I really like all the Microns and the fact, I just don't like the, the idea that I have to write at that exact angle the entire time. It really wears my hand out. That I had a quiet space in some of these areas because the rest of it is runny ink. So she has a little net on her head. So I'm gonna try to throw in some lines of the white. So it looks like she's got a net of white on her head. We made her head yellow, made sure her head and her hair didn't bleed. It wasn't done in the zig so that we could have um, nice bleeds everywhere else. I tried to control the bleeds on the fabric and tried to make sure that the, the fabric didn't get out of control. I might even go back and saw at some of those edges with a little bit of the white later, but I tried to do a little bit of shading on the skin even though it was very small and far away. Same thing for the hands. And I had another Arthur Rackham piece here, which was this piece, and they can just do this uh, some other time, or I can do it as a separate YouTube video. And so I did enjoy doing this piece. I think we had a good time. And I hope you guys learned a little bit about Arthur Rackham and how to use the Elegant Writer pen and how to make sure you have a little bit of zig marker or some other permanent pen that doesn't run for areas that you don't want to get out of control. We don't want it to be 
the color is also trying to fight for precedence in the same piece. So that's why you've got like little garnishes of color. And we also tried to make sure that there was no color that was only used once in the composition. So we made sure that it sort of matched the rest of the composition a bit because otherwise it would look like it didn't really belong there. So I hope that you guys learned something. And if you have any further uh, questions or comments, then feel free to leave them. I will go to my comment box after I stop streaming to answer any questions. Until next time, I, I hope you guys have amazing watercolor and painting and ink adventures of your own.